pens. You know, one of the, please have your seat. One of the things you need to know about being all that God has called you to is don't get carried away with moments like that. I am serious. I'm not joking. Honestly, because the successes of yesterday are the weight against tomorrow. And it's so easy to get caught in, oh, I've done this, I've done that, and all of that, and you don't get to do what you need to do tomorrow. Because yesterday's gone, remember? Those are my simple principles for myself. Being there, done that, doesn't count anymore. There's still a life to live. I'm 56. If I live till 90 or 100, if I'm resting on the things we have just recited, that's past. So what will I do with the rest of life? So don't get caught in the past. Thank God for them. Leave them where they are. But if God thought you didn't have more to do, he won't keep you here. If you're done and finished, then it's better and safer to go home. But if you're still here, there's still work to be done. And one thing, past glory, or things we've done, or things past, is a weight around the feet. As an athlete, if you run with weight around your feet, you won't go that fast. So let it stay where it is. History records, but time, you're still accounting for every minute of your life and stay focused on the goal. That's how I move. Just the first instruction. I like to teach from every little thing that happens. Now, first I'd like to thank Pastor Kwaju and Terry. She's my darling and we have a personal story. You know, for this opportunity to speak into your lives. It's one of the biggest responsibility a servant of God would have to yield their stage and their people to anybody to speak to. Because you can destroy all the work they're doing just by what you say. And people get carried away sometimes and they do that. So for me, I always consider it a major responsibility. Now, I like the title because I don't like to be confined. And I like the fact that they're just two letters. You know, B and E. B, and you can be whatever you want to be with that title. But I'd like to start, and let me, I've thought about how to do this in the most effective way. And what I've made up my mind will do is, I'll set a background, but I want to engage with you. Please, otherwise it's a waste of time. We go to church often, we get preached at very often. A lot of people go home with too many questions they don't get to ask. And when you have a set-aside program like this, personally, I believe that the most productive way and effective way we do this is that we engage ourselves. Because then you can walk away with must-dos, need-to-do, and actionable points. Because we're dealing with your specifics, not what I assume is what you need. And of course, I would go very close to what you need because the Bible says as many as are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. So I will be led by the Spirit of God in the things that I will say, but I also want to be able to engage you. In my ministry in business, I have realized it's always very impactful to engage. So if you allow me, that's how I will work. But I'll start with an intro and then we'll run from what's real to you. Now, what does it mean for you to be? To be what? What do you want to be? To be your idea of who you are? Or to be all that your creator has made you to be? Because there's a master plan for every life. And that master plan is known and fully understood by your creator. My biggest ambition in life is to die empty. Totally empty that no talents, no giftings, no opportunities, nothing that I was born to do, that I have the capacity to do, that I do not do. 
I've already written down what will be written on my tombstone. Here lies an empty vessel, totally devoid of anything that I was given to use on this side of God's creation that she didn't. So when I die, I want to know that I finished the job. So when I'm running a race, I'm not running anybody's race. I'm running my personal race. And I'm running that race with only one teacher and one guide. His name is Jehovah. I'm accountable to only one person, and he's my God. I measure everything that I do by what I perceive is the call of God on my life and the things that are important to him. And if you search your scriptures enough, you will understand what is important to God. Your ways, your character, the way you deal with other people, your ability to take his biggest assignment, which is the gospel, to the ends of the earth and to the creations of his hands. Your ability to engage and influence people for the purpose of God and the good of humanity. Ultimately, everything that we do will fall into that. Every single thing. And the question you must ask yourself is, what is my God-ordained purpose? Now, will you fully comprehend it? No. Will you have a sense of where God has called you to? Yes. And you'll start sensing it from early on in your life, but you will never fully know it until the day you're about to die. What is the fullness of your life? Because we live in seasons. Different parts of our lives and our assignments are revealed to us at different stages. If you really understand it and you're sensitive to the spirit, you would realize that your life goes on in stages. You will sense that you will live many lives in one life. Because for a season, you're called to something. What you need for that season will be revealed. Everything you will ever need in your life has already been given to you, but you will never know all of it until the moment that you need them. And that is why it's important for us as children of God to conquer fear. Because fear tells you the things you can't do, but faith tells you what God has already called you to do. And if God says, I have sent you to do this, he will provide what you need to do, what you need to do that. The most important thing to understand that, in actual fact, the matter concerning you was finished. And because it is finished, what you need already exists, but you don't get it until you need it. So you walk a stage, you meet people, you learn lessons, things are revealed to you for that stage. When you get to another stage, but getting there requires you wanting to take on that stage. Because of fear, sometimes we're too afraid to take on challenge. Even in your workplaces, you work in an organization and there's an opportunity. And you look at him and you're like, ah, this one is too big for me, I can't do it. it says who? The Bible says I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. People look at you and say, because sometimes the people around you are more discerning than you about your own talents. People around you say to you, you can do this. Ah, no, 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 I cannot. In that moment, you allow what God has called you to, the opportunity he has opened for you to pass. Because you do not understand that when God says you can do all things, it means you can. God always means what he says. He wasn't suggesting. He was giving you an instruction. But except, can two walk together except they agree? No. And because you are not a robot, and God did not create you to be forced to do things, he needs you to agree with him in faith that you can do what he has told you that you can do. And as you step out, then he will manifest what he needs. Go back. To what Pastor Tony was saying at the beginning. Jesus didn't say, you are healed, go to the priest. No. He said, go to the priest. What do you go and do with the priest? You go and bear witness that this has happened. You go and report a miracle. But he's saying, 
by giving the final word. How do you not understand that all the in-between is already taken as happening? He gave the final word. So you can know that everything that will, leave to, that will lead to that final word is already settled. So when the Bible says you are more than a conqueror, it's because he already knows that no matter what situation you would face, he has given you everything to conquer plus more. That's why he said more than. He didn't say you're a conqueror. God doesn't play with words. He's not careless with words. And you know, I have a Muslim background. So I didn't become a Christian until my 20s. And I take the word of God literally. So some of you are so used to your Christianity because you were born and bred in it. So it, it, maybe it doesn't hold as much value. But I've seen two sides of life. And I know that this God means what he says. And I have seen his word come true. And I've learned to follow him. Will I always understand what he's saying? No. So in trying to figure what the Lord has called you to, you will not always understand. But you must have the courage to follow him. You must have the courage to take the steps. Take the action. I'd rather take the action and fail than not act at all. Because, you know, there's the portion of the Bible in Hebrew where it talks about them. They believed until the end. They did not receive what they believed for. But it was recorded for them as what? They got the reward of believing, though they didn't receive that which they believed for. They got exactly the same thing. It's like that man who employed people different hours of the day, but at the end, he paid them what? Same wages. Why? Because it was about answering the call. It wasn't about working 50 hours or working 10 hours or 5 hours. It was about answering the master's call. And to God, it meant exactly the same thing. So your vision or your call is not about the size of it. It's not about, oh, this one is reaching to 10 million people. Why am I called as a missionary to speak to five people? Who cares? What is the assignment you were assigned to? What is that thing that you perceive that God has called you to? How do you move on it? Now, a woman's life is in three ministries, as far as I'm concerned. The first ministry is you. The ministry of you. And it's the biggest ministry of your life. Because you were before anything else that we will speak about. And everything else is part of the you ministry. You were born for a purpose. God called you to an assignment in his kingdom. The kingdom of God is like a full screen cut up into tiny pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. He took different pieces of the puzzle and gave it to each man and woman that is sent to the face of the earth. Every time one piece is missing, the whole picture is distorted. Because if we don't have every piece, we don't have a full puzzle back. We never see the full picture. And whatever you don't do that is your part will distort all the people that are meant to be your touch points. So it's not just about you. But you are key to God's plan. You're not an accident of God's assignment. No, you're a deliberate part of God's plan. And everything you need, God has provided for you. You, ha you don't have everything you need now because you don't need it yet. You haven't walked into everything you need because it isn't time for that particular season. So don't measure your own time and your season by somebody else's. Everybody is working at different stages, different times to do different things. So there's you at a stage of life. God causes the bone of your bone or whatever to come. And then you walk into the ministry of the wife. The ministry of the wife only adds to the ministry of you. It's not supposed to take from the ministry of you. And then at a time, you move into the ministry of a mother. The ministry 
of the wife and the ministry of the mother adds to the ministry of you should never take away from the ministry of you. Because the core of your assignment is in you. And you are accountable for what God has called you to. Now, a lot of women think that the most important ministry in their life are the last two. Or any one of them. And the one they give up the most, and very quickly, is the ministry of you. Everything was part of you. God ordained an agenda for your life. Your husband's part and your children's part, that's part of it. But you're accountable for you. And that you includes the other two. And God doesn't set you up to fail. He never gives you a part and gives you the other part that will make you fail. You are accountable for the all. And you work out your own salvation. How you make it work. How you bring it all together. How many single women are in the house? Good, there are enough of you for me to spend a few minutes on it. You know, every young girl has a dream. Has a sense of this and that and all of that. But we don't spend enough time to teach people about the total picture of their lives and about those other stages. And so girls get to life and think that, oh, everybody says if you don't get married, something's wrong with you. There's nothing wrong with you. When is your time? When is your time to be married? If you're working with the purpose of God for your life, God has ordained who he has prepared to qualify, to support you, to be you, but in his role as your husband. And, but we are responsible for the physical decisions. And a lot of times, because we don't have understanding, we allow other considerations to guide our decision. And therefore, we walk away from the purpose of God and we make mistakes that cost us. You're not just meant to marry. You're meant to follow God to find the man that has been assigned to you to help you to fulfill the call of God on your life. Your husband is meant to be a nurturer and a support in your life. He's meant to be an encourager and a builder. A man that has the capacity to contain everything that God has called you to. Not the man that you need to bury who God has called you to be in order to marry him. There's a mistake there. I know that every girl wants to wear fancy dress. Buy a wedding dress and practice. I don't joke with these things. I'm not joking at all. Because in life, there are many women that have married, that are widows, and they're still living. There are many women that did not marry. Mother Teresa didn't marry. When you get to heaven, they don't ask about your husband and your children. They ask about your ministry. And if you're married and you have children, it's how your ministry affected your husband and your children you will account for. But it's about how you have lived the purpose of God as he has assigned it to you. Your husband is meant to be an enhancer of that. Your children are meant to be a fruit of the ministry of God in your life. The core assignment of God for you as a woman is you. And everything else is meant to help to fulfill that. So if you're single, please, I beg you on my knees, don't marry a fool. Don't marry a guy because he has money, he's handsome, he's tall, he's this. Haven't you seen tall men because short as they get fat? <laughs> I'm not joking. Haven't you seen the coolest guy before? He had a lot of hair. Soon enough, he's what? He's bald. You feed him well enough, his tummy goes out. So, so that tells you it's not about the physical man. It's about the content of the man, the character and the strength of that man. The fear of God in that man is ability to help you be what God has called you to be. His ability to hear God 
and yield to God in nurturing you to be the best of yourself. And sometimes what you see now is not what the future holds. So some guys look like they're rich now. Five years down the line, ten years down the line, what do you know? Some guys look that they have nothing now. Or they're simple, they're about to just offer you a simple life. And everybody tells you you're insane. And that's the one that turns out great. God has a lot of surprises along the path of our life. And because we can't see that much, we need to walk closely with God through the ministries of our life. What has God called you to be? What must you do? How have you empowered and equipped yourself? How are you fighting and standing for that which you know is the call of God on your life? I didn't know too much. Even as a young Muslim girl, but I knew I wanted to make something of my life. I knew certain things that I sensed. And at the right time, God made sure that he took me over so that I would be able to live the life he had prepared for me. But even before then, I had some small, small sense that I applied. So somebody likes me, wants to marry me. He's a soldier. I don't want to be no soldier's wife. <laughs> Not because there's anything wrong with him, but I wanted to have a life. I wanted a family that would be together, and I wanted to have a full career. And as, as far as I understood it then, they're always moving from one place to the other. Then at another stage, there was a diplomatic guy, and I thought, I'm no diplomat's wife. Why? Most times, the wives of the diplomats don't work. They follow their husbands to the different stations. They do some work to keep busy in, when they're in those countries, but they can't have a full career. And I knew I wanted to make something of my life. I didn't really know what it was, but I sensed in my life in, that I wanted to make something of my life. So I took hard decisions. As a young girl, I said, no, I'm not doing that. Then somebody had a fancy idea that since I was a Muslim girl and there was somebody who loved me and had plenty of money and everything, I would make somebody's second wife. And I thought, Amy, I'm nobody's second wife. Somewhere, there's my own husband. And everybody told me, you know, you're too smart and ambitious as a young woman. Most young men can't cope with you. You're going to end up marrying an older person. I, said, I don't care. If that's the older person that is called to me, as long as he has the capacity to help me to be me. But God in his wisdom, as I stood, I met the Lord. As I met the Lord, I met my husband months before I met the Lord. Same year. I met my husband in January. I became a Christian months to my wedding. It's true. And in that year, by the end of that year, I gave my life. I, I got married. What I'm saying is this. It looks like, let me just marry this guy. It's a key success factor in your life. Your ability to be, your spouse is key. So if you're single, be deliberate about the considerations that lead to that decision. It's not an emotional decision. It's a practical decision based on your prayers, your discernment, and your ability to look at the situation and make a call. Women love men very easily. A man that is good to you every day, you love him. And the one you think you're madly in love with that beats you up every day, you soon hate him. Choose your path. Invest in yourself. People ask me every day, how do you do so many things at the same time? I am focused on what I want to do. Whatever I sense, this is where the Lord wants me to go. I will fight for it in every way. I also have no silly ideas 
about being invisible. I don't know what a superwoman is. I just know a woman who loves God and trusts God and who is willing to follow God every step of the way. I have no problem whatsoever delegating things to people. I don't play to my weakness. I play to my strength. If somebody is better at something than me, I don't do it. I give it to somebody else, that person, to do. I focus on my own strength and enjoy the support of the people who are better at the things I'm not good at. Why? It's a waste of time for me trying to catch up when somebody already can do it better than me. I will play to my own strength and everybody else has to be trying to catch up with me. People. The other part of it is people. People in your life will make a difference. People, 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 people. Be sure as a woman of your network, let your support base be critical to where you're going. Find the right voices around you that will encourage you and lead you and support you in line with where you want to go. I remember the first day I, went, I was invited to speak to the group chairman of the first bank group then. I didn't even know what he was for. And when he spoke to me about chairing an insurance company, they were just starting. I said, me, insurance. I don't know anything about insurance. I cannot do it because it's not my forte. And he looked at me and said, what we need you have. The people who are technical insurance people will be there. But it's a startup. It's a joint venture between two multinationals, an international company and, and uh, the bank. And you have built international joint venture partnership in your business. So you have that experience. You have started businesses from the scratch. So you have that experience. After a while, I said, OK, let me go and pray. And I'll come back, sir. So I went away. But I sat with my friend, and I said, this is a conversation I had, and she said, of course, for you, it's a piece of cake. And I'm like, how? I said, you, you can do it. It's no, no big deal. By the time she finished with me, my mind was in a place. I went home to my husband and told him, and he did exactly the same thing. That's why you need to marry the right guy. You cannot marry the guy who immediately sees that at that moment and say, ah, this woman is about to go places. No, 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 you can't do it. No, 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 tell them you can't. For what? He said, no, of course you can. Yes. I'm like, ah, but this, but that. He answered every question I had. I called my pastor. I said, I had this conversation today with this great man. So pray along with me. So he said, okay. He went, prayed, came back to me, saw me in church on the Sunday of it and said, God hasn't told me you shouldn't do it. <laughs> but he left it to me to go and make the decision. Because you know what? The Bible says in the multitude of counsel, there's safety. And you must seek counsel. But counsel is information. The real decision is yours. Why? You're the only person with a 360 degree view of your life. You're the one that's spoken to all the different people. So you have all the information. You're the one that has in your heart a nudging and a direction and a leading of God. You are the one that must be able to bring it all together. And know that is this decision strategic to my life and to the assignment of God for my life or not? I pondered on everything that everybody said. And then I went back and said, sir, can I come and see you? He said, yes. I went back and I said to him, you know, I pondered on all of these things. I prayed. And I see this as a big challenge. But I see you, you're a very shrewd businessman. For you to think I can do this, I consider that a major challenge. And I love challenges. What is my confidence to take on challenges? Jehovah. Because the Bible already says I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. And I will never be alone. Because God will lead me every step of the way. And the Bible says the greater one dwells on the inside of me. So I said, I'm willing to take on this challenge. Did I even know where the story was going? So I said, okay. And he was happy. I said, okay. So I went away. One month after, I got this message this day saying, you've been appointed to the board of First Bank. And I'm like, ah. Uh -uh. 
formation. That's different from the conversation I had with them. But apparently, you know, they interview people in different ways for different things. They test your heart. Because think about it, how many people will say no to coming to serve on the board of First Bank? But I didn't even know that's what I was being interviewed for. Three months after resuming on the board of First Bank, they then still appointed me to chair the board of that insurance company as a startup. I pursued it the best way I knew. In two years, we're a profitable company as opposed to five years they had projected. No, don't clap. So we'll save time. Don't clap. We'll clap at the end. <laughs> and once we did that, once that came up, they moved me from there and moved me to the investment bank part of the group. Was I an investment banker? No. You heard my CV. I'm a graduate of chemistry. I spent the rest of my life building my own manufacturing group in furniture and security systems. These were not my core area, but my core was building businesses, and I had enough mind to make things happen. I had a strategic mind, and I could pursue a goal and make it happen. And the rest of it was I had a God that was bigger than every situation. Yeah. And I went there, now emboldened, haven't seen that. Well, yeah, insurance wasn't so bad after all, even though I was not the insurance person. And I went with my God and came out at the end of it three years after with a great team in that institution. We'd done a great job. And I was just finishing on that, still serving on the board of the bank when they did the unthinkable. Yeah. And then appointed me to be chair of their largest asset, which is the commercial banking group. What is the point there? What you need for tomorrow, why should God give you today? The only thing you need to have today is that you can trust him to take you through is that you are willing to do, that you prepare yourself, that you educate and equip yourself, that you empower yourself, that you seek to fulfill that goal that you build a system around yourself that makes it possible for you. Does that mean there will be no troubles? Plenty troubles. But that when every trouble comes, you would remember that the Bible already says in the world you will see troubles. But know ye that Jesus overcame for you in advance and that the wisdom of God will lead you through everything day by day. This is the risk of me starting. Okay, let me just stop and let's come from your view. Who has the mic? Okay, who is going to be the first person that would ask the first question? I like that hand at the back. Thank you. Bold and confident. Is there a mic to give her there? She's right at the back. I hear you have question cards, so if you don't want to speak, you can write and please pass forward so we can move as quickly as we can. Yes. Good morning, everyone. Morning, Good morning, ladies. Ma. Uh, my name is Shiba, and my question is, I want to grow a career, but in a case where um, you're working in a startup company and um, you don't have somebody to look up to in um, guiding you, how do you know that you are doing the right thing in what you are doing? Okay. In the startup where you are working, are they still happy with you? Yes, they are. Then you are doing the right thing. <laughs> you know, and who do you look up to? The, first and foremost, as long as there's a boss ahead of you at work, related to that work, there's someone to look up to around you. But the world is so small now. The problem of who to look up to is not a problem anymore. Look around you and see what, who is it that speaks to your aspiration and take learnings from them. And I'll tell you, there, isn't, there can never be one person that speaks to your aspiration. So don't want to live somebody else's life. The one thing you must never forget is how to live your own life. And what you do is glean from other people 
But don't ever give up your own life to live somebody else's life. So look around you for people that are doing things that relate to where you want to go or where you sense you want to go. And don't be afraid to change direction. Because sometimes what you perceive or what you see is not exactly right, but you need a transit point. And the Lord will take you through the transit point in order to discover the actual point. Which is why you need to be prayerful. All right? Thank you. Look around you. You'll find people to look up to. Yes, next question. Okay. Good morning. My name is Evo. Morning. Good morning, Ma. Um, I wanted to ask this question because we've got several companies. How did you go about sort of, I mean, looking back now, do you have a blueprint for how you kind of churned out the companies one after the other without sort of losing focus and mm -hmm. being I had, successful at I, that? I, I had no, no blueprint. Look. When you start um, your first business, your responsibility is to make a success of that first business, to use it to test your talents, to use it to prove your skills, to prove to the band, to prove to the community that you can stay with something and bring it to success. Now, one of the things that you benefit from staying put in an industry is that as you do it, all the opportunities within that market and that industry will begin to show up. Now, you prayerfully identify which of them are yours. And you will see some that are natural extensions of your business. And you can readily move into them. But with the track record of staying long enough to build something in the first one, it's then easier for you to get support. Banks have your account from your first business. They can see that you're a disciplined, responsible person that is committed. They can see that you would fight with integrity to make something of what you're doing. Therefore, they're willing to give you money for the second one. If it's not a bank, people can see, and therefore they're willing to invest with you in the other project. So learnings you've had from the first business will help you with the next one. And that's really how like, it's why I always say the Bible isn't wrong when it says don't despise the days of humble beginnings. And it's also when people talk about, oh, multiple streams of income. Don't be confused. They, they didn't mean multiple streams of income from day one of your life. You have to prove yourself. Prove your talent. Learn stuff from your first experiment. Make it work. And sometimes you don't need more than the one. It depends on your own call. That's why I say, don't live anybody else's life. So for each of the businesses, some of them came just out of situations and out of circumstances. And you must know how to respond and why. Some are just accidental. My security door business, I did not sit for one second to think about getting into security door business. It's true. With the furniture, I was servicing a lot of banks. One day I got a call. God bless his soul, told someone to call me from GT and said, uh, find, I hear you're going to Italy. And they sent a picture of those bulletproof doors you see at the entrance of banks. Said, can you find this for us? So I took it. I was doing a favor to my friend, my brother, and a client. I went to Italy. I asked my business associates, where did you find this thing? They made some calls and said to me, talk to this company. I spoke to that company, and they sent me all the information. And then called to say, oh, we don't do business in Africa. I want to be. I said, mm, I'm not interested. I know my business. Because sometimes you'll be blind. Which is why you need God. I know what I'm focused on. But I would, this, somebody wants this. I will take it to them for you. I brought it back. Gave all the information, including, no, including price. No, they didn't give me price then. To GT. They asked for the price. I asked them for the price. I gave it to them. And then they looked at it and said, okay, we want to buy. So I called those people. These guys want to buy. They said, we can't sell to them. I'm like, ah, you have a product. You have a buyer. What's your problem? <laughs> they don't sell to end users. As a model, they will only sell through a, a dealership. Why? The maintenance for them is more important than the sale. So I said, eh, they have maintenance people that work in their bank. Train them. They said, no. What if 10 banks want to buy it? Will we train all their people? That that's not how it's done. So I said, well, you have a problem. I didn't think it was mine. <laughs> I'm serious. Then what happened? Within 
that period, as we're having all this conversation, there was a multiple robbery in Egbeda somewhere. About four banks in one day, they killed a lot of people and everything. And I, was, I went to see some people I called my Keja parents on that day, and they were talking about the robbery. And I'm like, hey, and there's something in my car that can solve the problem. And the daddy in the house said, I should go and bring the thing. I brought it. He looked at it. He called his wife. Haven't I been telling you Nigerian banks need this thing? It was like a light bulb moment. Now, the one thing about me, my pastor calls me Oliver Twist. Once I catch a revelation, I run. So the next day, I just got on the plane and went straight to that factory in Italy. Went to see the operation and everything and all of that, and I signed West African dealership with them and came back. Then I went back to GT and said, okay, now you can buy it. <laughs> so God ordained it, set me up. It's one business I can tell you categorically I had nothing to do with. And I've been doing it now for about 25 years. But I had nothing to do with it. Now, I actually own the factory that produces it in Italy. Because the guys that were producing for me went bankrupt. And... I had customers that I was committed to, maintenance and all of that, and the only thing of integrity I could do was to ensure I can continue to keep my word to them. So I went to them, can I buy the rights and take the key stuff that I need? And that's what I did. So some of it will be accidental, but there, as there are no accidents in our lives, God will unfold different things at different seasons. Because I had so many problems with our products, that if I didn't know it was God, I would have fainted, as the Bible says. I would be on my knees asking God, God, please let the door in this place be working. Let the one you know in be working. Let, and I would say, God, but I didn't look for this, so you gave it to me. So you've got to make this work. And that's how it worked. Next question. No, no. Yeah. Um, I have a number of questions here. I will try to distill some of it. One, someone is asking, I'm dating a guy that you said... You have to speak out. So can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. So the question is, you said you need to marry a man who would support you um, towards your no, life. No, I said a responsible man. I didn't say a man who would support you. You see, because a responsible man is different from a man who will support you. A man who will support you means your own hands are down. And the man is your provider. God is your provider. But a responsible man is the man who would use his resources to the best of his ability to do all he can do in his household. Now, that does not exclude that the woman is a major contributor to that. And in some seasons and some times, the woman will be a bigger contributor. But you must understand the ways of God. God says the two is one. What does that mean? God doesn't see a man and a woman. He sees a household. Once you are married, God sees one. He will provide for the one through either part of it. If there's mutual love and respect between the two of you, you will use your resources to enhance your household and it's nobody's business. So you... you Look, there are a lot of traditional, cultural mindsets that are not based on the Bible. And they actually have destroyed the way a lot of women fulfill the purpose of God in their lives. It's also what leads to all this silly adage, my money is my money, my husband's money is our money. And then you waste your own money, never build anything tangible out of it, and something happens to the man and you still cannot help your family. There's a need to understand the plan of God. If all of you like the Proverbs 31 woman, did they tell you at any point that she was lazy? Did they tell you she did, because of what she did, her husband was honored in the gate. She did everything. But I'm not saying, because I know some women hate the Proverbs 31 woman. But frankly, you are accountable for your life. You are accountable for your own talents. You are accountable for maximizing your ability. Why do you want to be a millionaire if God ordained you to be a billionaire just because you want the man to be the one that pays your bills? Your talents will bless your home, 
will bless your city, it will bless your nation, and it will bless the world. And the best place is that your husband is fully accomplished, and you are fully accomplished, and you're both working together for the good. So I'm sorry, I'm sensitive to words, because I have seen words derail a lot of people. I didn't say support. I said a responsible man. Good. Okay, so this question, she's... Okay, so she says, can I marry someone I'm not attracted to, though he's a good person and ready to do everything right with me and for me? You know, this is, you see why I love question and answer? Because someone will interpret my saying, it's not an emotional decision, to you should go and marry someone you are not attracted to. How are you going to marry someone you are not attracted to? in itself is the same as marrying a man because he has money. Yeah. It's exactly the same. Yeah. Obviously, there will be some level of attraction to a man. Obviously, if you search your heart well, there will be love in your heart for the man that you marry. Don't worry. I'm a tomboy, so this one's I know. There will be love in your heart for the man that you marry. You will know that you have can two work together except they agree? You have commonalities. You can converse. Are you going to cover your eyes every time you're in the bedroom? You know, so that's not what I'm talking about. I'm just saying sometimes women know the man that they're attracted to, but they would consider the one that they think is possible but has some other things. And they will go with the money and the looks and the office and the position or family. All of those things. That's all I'm trying to say. Thank you. Okay, Ma. Um, this particular one says, how do you recover from multiple failures? How do you build up your confidence again after to go, how do you build up your confidence again to go after what you know you should do after you have failed several times? Okay, I love the question. Sit down, because that will take me a few minutes. <laughs> no, no. I'll explain to you why this is critical and is important. And the devil is a smart ass. Oh, yeah. He likes to set the children of God up to think that, oh gosh, I failed here. I can't do this. In my vocabulary, there's nothing called failure. How many times shall a child of God fail? And yet he will stand again. <laughs> Multiply it. 70 times, what's that, 490. Anybody that's counted 490 failure? I only use that to just create a shock in that. But the real thing is this. The journeys of our life are not the same. The experiences we will have that God permits will always have a purpose in it. The things we will do will not necessarily sometimes end up in the results we assume that it will. But one of my most favorite scriptures that I live by is that every single thing works together for my good. Every single thing, no matter what it is, every single thing is at work for my good. When my enemy is plotting my downfall, they are working for my upliftment. Because every single thing works for my good. Why? When I take a wrong turn, there are things on the route of the wrong turn that I will never come in contact with except I took that wrong turn. Remember, it was not my set turn. It was the wrong turn. But along that path, there will be things I will pick up. What will allow me to pick up things and find them useful? My mindset. My ability to understand that everything on the face of the earth is working for me. That God is the master of the universe. He controls every circumstance and every situation in my life. And even every error that man sees, it serves my purpose to prepare me for the place of my future. I told you I wasn't a Christian. I was a Muslim. My name is Bilkisu. 
I was born and brought up in a Muslim home. My great-grandfather was the first alaji in the city of Ibadan. In the days when they used to walk. But the experience of my journey as a Muslim has taught me how to take God at his word. He has taught me diligence with God and dedication to the things of God. And those were learnings that I brought into my Christian faith. As a Muslim that became a Christian, for me, the word of God is exactly what it is. He doesn't suggest, he instructs. I take his instruction, I believe him at his word, and I let him manifest himself. Will I understand it? The Bible says some things have not been given to me to understand. I'll be, they are mysteries unto God and unto God alone. So when it doesn't work out as I want it, I put that in the bucket of mysteries unto God. And unto him alone. And he says, on that day, all truth will be what? Will be revealed to me. There are no failures. There are lessons. What makes you feel you have failed? Because people around you think so. Didn't they tell you that Tiger Woods was done? Don't ever let people impose their own personal opinion based on their limited view on you. Because you conclude you have failed only because other people have said so. And you conclude you have failed because your desired goal was not accomplished. Your desired goal is not as important as God's purpose and plan and goal for you. And whilst you might think that is how this journey should end, if God has ordained, it should end somewhere else. What you see now that you consider to be your failure is only when you get to the end, you realize, ah, gosh, that's why God took me there. Because the person you met on that wrong turn is the one you will meet at the gate of your destination. And because he remembers you from there, he opens the door for you to enter. So please, I beg you, don't walk life with a sense of, I have failed, I haven't failed. Let me tell you what life is. The way, see, look at this stage. From this end to that end, consider it your life. Your life as God has ordained it. So, you are walking this journey. You're here, as you can see, or as other people can see, this is not how you should be, by their opinion. Things are not working out for you. This is a failure point. Then you manage to gather yourself together, and you move again. You get here. They still think you have failed. Things haven't worked out, and all of that. You get here. It's working out small, but it's not compared to your friends, compared to your mates, compared to your sister, compared to your neighbor, compared to your brother. Hey? And by the time you get here, it looks a little brighter. You say, oh, well, God has tried, but this is not how I planned my life. <laughs> then, then you get here, and all of a sudden, there's a light bulb moment. And you're like, oh, my God. Oni bere koloni shell. It's not about who started first. I'm an athlete. There are many people who are ahead of the race in a 100 meters race. But do you know who will fall? Do you know who spikes will fail? Do you know who will sleep? Do you know what will happen? The winner is the guy who crosses this line. And your journey has different spots. How do you judge God and the journey of your life halfway through? Three quarter of the way through. How do you judge him before you get to the end? Some of your friends will move so fast. But some move fast and fail at the end. Some seem slow. And then at one stage of life, psh, when I started my business for the first 15 years, because I had all this my value system, do things according to the word of God. You can't do this. You can't pay bribe. Can't do. Can't do. There were days I would cry. I'm being honest with you. 
and I'll feel like, God, I'm better than this person. I know this business more than this person. How is it the ones that when they get the job, they need my help to do it? Who will get the biggest jobs? Because I won't do the things that they're willing to do. <clears throat> you will seem slow. But God kept me going and kept me sustained. It took 15 years. It was almost as if my cup had to be full. And when we got to a point, it was like I was in a race of my life. Everything just moved at such, it literally every year, I got appointed to one board or the other, did this. It was as we crossed that 15 year line, everything just ramped up at the speed. Business, appointments, this one, that one, visibility, everything. What was it 15 years for? Search your Bible. Read Isaiah 92. Is it Isaiah 92 or Psalm 92? Find about the palm tree. You don't even need your Bible. Go and read agricultural records. Find about the palm tree and find about the, what's that thing, bamboo tree. For two years that you plant a palm tree, there's nothing, no sign that it will ever, ever grow. It looks like you've wasted your effort. And then you see the sprout two years after. And then it starts a little at a time. And it takes so many years. And then it gets. But when the wind and the storm comes, who stands? As compared to what? The grass. That's what the Bible says. The grass grows six months. It's green, luscious, rich. But shortly after two, it's dried and they set fire to it to burn it off. And the ground upon which it grew will not even remember that it existed. With the bamboo trees, five years before it comes out of the soil. But after five years, even though it's skinny and tall, it grows, psh, and you think, oh, this one, I can knock it over. Try. Because its foundation is invisible to you. The journey that you call your failure is God's preparation of your life for your future. It's building character. The Bible says the trial of our faith, what? Work at patience in us. It's building character in you. It's teaching you tenacity. It's teaching you perseverance. It's teaching you to face people, to abound and to abase, to deal with different situations. Because when you get to the place where the Lord has prepared for you, everything you've picked up in what man has called failure, you will find extremely useful to survive there. Don't let the devil define who you are. But the lessons to learn, when you want to do anything, do it well. Seek counsel. Do your research. If it's business, do your SWOT test. Do your due diligence. Gain all the knowledge. Ask all the questions. Do the hard work before you execute. And when you're executing, be sensitive, be flexible, be responsive. Listen to people. Listen to counsel. When something isn't working, check what you're missing. Don't be arrogant about what you think you know. And the greatest part of it all, birth everything you're doing in prayers and let the Lord lead you and guide you. And ultimately, you will find that your light afflictions are but for a moment. They work it for you, an exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Failure is nothing. Trust me. It's not over until it's over. It's the reason a lot of people commit suicide. Because they judge God and their life by an interim stage. And they decide nothing is going to happen. Who knows if they were right at the door of their transformation. So don't ever buy into the failure story. Whatever it is, go back to God and ask him. This isn't working. Tell me what to do. The Bible says you will hear a voice telling you which way to go. Whether to turn to the right or to turn to the left, that you might walk in it. That's how you live your life and you win. And 
I don't, people say, what's the biggest trouble you've gone through? I never answer those questions. To me, they're silly. Why? I'm still living. Whatever challenges I've seen yesterday, that's nothing. As long as I'm still trying to run the race of my life, the devil will throw some more things in my way. So how do I know which one? The only thing I need to know is that whenever it comes, I have a bigger God and I'm ready for it. And every knee will bow at the name of Jesus. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much, ma'am. There's a recurring question, so I'm going to paraphrase it. Okay. And this, so a lot of the women are asking, supposing I'm already in a marriage and I feel it's not working, not working because of what you have said. He's not supporting me. He's not encouraging me. He's not doing anything. Okay, I'm trying, I'm struggling with the words. I know the question, believe okay, me. I've so, answered these questions 1,000. And 1, also for work. Uh, oh. So you have a boss who is um, intimidating, oppressing you. How can you achieve? How can you um, achieve the goals you have set? So what do you do? Okay. There are two separate questions, and the approach is totally different. Your husband, you're already married, so I did not give you a license to go and divorce. <laughs> now, the wisdom of God answers to every situation. The wisdom of God answers to every situation. And your situations are not the same. Every woman's situation is different. So don't judge your own marriage by another person's. Now, one thing I always say to women, you need to think of how you will play to win. This is my home. This is my husband. This is the nature of the man I have married. That is my reality and the context of my life. In that reality and the context of my life, wait with where I want to go. What is the strategy? What are the things I'm doing now I need to change? What is the approach I need to apply in order to be able to achieve my goal? Some will tell you, why do you need to kneel down for your husband? Why do you need to do say, See, one woman and what? And her husband. You are the one in your home. You are the one with your vision. You are the one with your ambition. Whatever it is, wherever it is that you want to go, every woman must work out how to speak to her husband's side that listens. How to speak to her husband's heart in a way that he responds. And for each man, it is different. Your responsibility, knowing that you want to win with your goals, is you work out your own personal strategy that gets you. Not what your friend is doing in her home. Not what your sister is doing in her home. Not what your sister-in-law is doing in her home. I understand exactly what I'm saying. There's a course that I run that's called 360 Life. It was because this is a question I answer one million times that I decided to find time to do this. And I've done two sessions. I only take 30 people in that class. I think they register online. There's an online version of the course that you can watch in your privacy by yourself. And in that course, I spend two full days with the women in the class. We speak a lot of confidential things, but we break it down. The only women I ask to register are women who are ambitious, who know where they're going, who are determined to get to the top of it, and in doing that, they want to have their home and raise their children. They want to fulfill the purpose of their life. That's why it's called the 360 degree life. Hey, see, this is my administrator of the program. What do you want to say? Okay, she wants to give you the website. This guy is too sharp. <laughs> okay. It's called? It's called Trainee www.trainee.com. The name of the course is The 360 Life with Ibuku Awoshika. The 360 Degree Life with Ibuku Awoshika. I always forget the details. But it's, it's a difficult... Some of what you, you need for this question is a difficult thing in the multitude. There are what I call women wisdom. Let's not call it women secrets. Women wisdom. 
that helps to get there. However, it is the only thing I can tell you, it is not impossible. Whoever you have married, God is God of the universe. One thing I know, everybody has a boss. Whoever that man is, however you see him, whoever you think he is, everybody has a boss. And you must learn to go back to his master, to send his master to him, to give you the wisdom and the understanding to achieve the goal that his master has placed on your life. But you must first understand that it's every woman and her own husband. It's not a general journey. It's the two of you and your unique unit. And you work to win, you play to win based on your own goal for your life, not on anybody else's. This you can do. So pray about it. Try and understand that man a bit more. Face what your reality is, and based on what that reality is, work out your own strategy to get it to work. And your eyes are blinded to the left and to the right. And focus on what you want to achieve in your home, and you will. I can tell you, you will. I've walked through this with many women, and I've seen people who are sure they're on their way out, fully established back in their home. There's certain fundamental things about men. Men love to be honored, to be respected, to be this, okay. Women love this, this, this. Learn the things you need to learn and play with it to get what you need to get. Next question. So it's a more general question, which is how do I balance being a mother, a wife, and a career woman? Okay. Mother, wife, career woman. First, like I said at the beginning, there are no super women. It's a fallacy. Get all the help that you need. And organize yourself for the stage of life that you're in. Sometimes you would take certain kinds of jobs over a stage in other to finish some things. But whilst you're doing that, you're equipping yourself, you're educating yourself, you're retooling yourself, and you're organizing yourself. And once that part is done, you continue with your career. How can your home work? In Nigeria of today, what is your responsibility to make sure your family is fed? Who cares who cooks the food? That's one thing that can happen. And if your husband will only eat your own cooking, no problem. Maybe you have weekends. Cook the food. Pack it. If he only wants to eat fresh food every day, he should have married a teacher. <laughs> Not you. You need to organize yourself to succeed. Today, some women still like to go to Oyimbo, to go to somewhere. As long as you enjoy it and it works for you, I'm happy for you to do whatever works for you. But if you work in a bank, you're not going to close. Some of you will end up at work on a Saturday or something. Then you know that sold out, easy cook, easy something is an option for you and businesses like that. As long as your husband wants snail, there's snail in your fridge. That's fine. He wants a way to let it be there. He wants this. He doesn't even have to know where it came from. That's just the truth. No, it's true. In fact, sometimes the away do you give him, you didn't cook it. Because there are people who cook the soups and deliver to your house. Look, you have to have wisdom. You don't need to announce that the away do came from somebody, somebody. No. When the awedu is delivered, you pour it into the pot, and the pot on the fire. We 
women must know how to train their homes to work for them, yes. including your husbands. Yes. Because sometimes it's the women that are overly indulgent. Yes. You must learn to train your husband. What does he want? Attention. So, and he wants to be fed. Make sure the food is there. Pay him attention. Even if you are not on your way home and there's somebody to give him the food at home, you are calling. Hey, I'm on my way. Oh, have you eaten? Have you not eaten? Is the food there? Da 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 da. Yeah. Work out your own strategy. So that one, how do you make it work? Children, hey, oh, find the right schools for your children. Find, you know, I have three sons, and I've been busy all my life. And my children are two generations. My first is 27. My second is 24. My baby is 17. It's true. And when my baby was in, doesn't like to be called baby. <laughs> he, he will answer you and say, I'm my mommy's baby, but I'm not a baby. When he was in nursery school at Corona VI, look, my son requires that I bathe him in the morning, I dress him up and sit down with him to have breakfast and pray with him and I must see him off to the car and wave bye-bye as he's going. No problem. It's early in the morning. I'm still at home. So we'll do all that. But in the afternoon, I can never be at his school to pick him up because God knows where I would be in town, in the factory or something. So we had a plan in my own house. I arrange him and all of that. It's my driver that takes him to school in the morning or sometimes my husband's driver, but in the afternoon, it's my husband's driver that picks him up because my husband is more stable. He sits in the office more than I do because I have multiple locations. So sometimes it's my husband that will go with the driver because he's coming from a meeting or something to pick up his son from school. So his teacher in nursery school will see his father more than me. And then one day, my husband came home and said, hmm, what am I And I'm like, eh, what happened? He said, ah, that the teacher said to him that, oh, we never even see Ola Mikosi's mommy at all. I said, eh, okay. I went straight to the school the next day. No, no, you must fight your own battles. I went straight to the school the next day. I went to the headmistress and said, you train your teachers to mind their business and never get involved in other people's business. And then I told her exactly what happened. And she was so apologetic, and that teacher eventually got moved. Now, it wasn't about wanting a teacher to lose a, a job. It was about wanting a system to work right. Because you, you're not in my home. <clears throat> you don't know that the things I do in the morning and you don't know that I cannot be there in the afternoon because my husband and I have worked it out. It's co-parenting. <laughs> husband and wife have children. It's not wife has children and husband doesn't have children. So you must learn how to stand your ground and not allow other people. Now, should I now feel guilty and start trying to run to the school every afternoon? No. All the other parents in the class, some of them is their first child. I've done that. <laughs> so they have time to come to the class every time. Come and see teacher, come and do this. I already did that. I have two, there's 10 years between my first and my youngest. So I already know how to make it work without necessarily being there. But I can, I'm there when it's parents meeting, when it's prize giving day, when it's those things. And I've trained three normal children. And my kids have done well. My first went to school, went to King's College London. My second went to school, went to University of Edinburgh. My baby is in A-levels now, and he will do well. Amen. So it's not about, I'm there from morning till night. The children don't need you morning till night. That's the truth. I'm doing what works for me. Why? I am accountable to God for the call of God on my life. And God expects that the husband and the children will all work together for my good. But I have to make it work by my actions and my decisions and the support system. My mother-in-law lived with us for 20 years. Why? First, she's a fantastic woman. My husband loves his mother. Two, I wanted, because I was busy, to have the stability 
of an adult in my home who does not move. So even as house helps move, my mother-in-law was a stable factor in my home with my children. As I have house helps, I always had cousins I was raising in my house. Why? Whenever I had no house help, I still had people in the house. Work out your own strategy. So those are critical decisions you must make. Determine what counts for your own life. And so, ah, I don't want a mother-in-law. Good for you. <laughs> Mine, for 20 years, created stability in my house and gave my children that stable environment. I had my cousin that I raised for many years who lived with me and got married from my house. And she looked after my children. When I traveled with my kids, she was the one that would travel with us, with the kids, until later when I could take a house girl to travel and all of that. So I'm just saying there are systems that must work. The question is, where do you want to go to? What do you want to achieve? What are the things you're willing to overlook? Because that's another thing. Do you understand what Yoruba people say, Amojukuro? Because you focus on irrelevant things as opposed to the most important things. You take your eyes off some things and forgo and stay focused on what is key and what is important. Very last question. Okay. I was looking at the time of. Yeah. I have Pastor Tony's permission. Okay. The very last question. Um, I think we missed this out. The one about the job where you have a boss that intimidates, oppresses, okay. and doesn't allow okay. you to achieve. Okay. First and foremost, you are not buried in any job. No, no. Every job is a decision to stay there or not. And sometimes you must learn to fight for yourself within an organization. But also, you must decide what you want out of that organization. You know, we talked about taking your eyes off things now. Depending on where you are and what the issues and the factors are, you can decide to tolerate a situation because it serves your goal. But you keep yourself above board, which means that nobody must be able to say it's because you didn't do your work. It's really important. Two, if it's a matter of the man wants to sleep with you and because of that, what I always say to young women, if a man is at work and is harassing you and wants to make your life miserable because of the work, go into his office, shut the door on him. No witnesses, just you and him. And tell that man, the next time you try to mess around with me or you try to affect, do whatever, 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 what I would do to you, your generations will not, you have nothing. Will. You just have Jesus. You don't have Juju, you don't have any, you have Jesus. But you shut the door, you look him in the eyes. Let me tell you, most women don't know how to look a man straight in the eyes. Most women don't. If you have daughters in this house today, please, from when they're kids, teach them to look at their brothers and their father in the eye. It will save them from a life of agony. A lot of women do not know how to look a man straight in the eyes. And because women cannot, when you're talking to a man and you look down, what you've done is to give him control. There's simple things that mean things. When a man is talking to you, eh, what's wrong with you, can you go and, and you look down, you're saying, I'm submitted to you. If you look him straight in the eye, he's the one that is intimidated, not you. Because men cannot deal with a woman that looks them straight in the eye. You look him straight in the eye, you let him finish, and you give your answer, and you say, the next time you say that rubbish to me, or the next time you stand in the way of my life, my career, because of anything, by the time I'm done with you, you will not know what happened to you. You open the door and say, how are you, sir? <laughs> and every time you see him thereafter, morning, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Nobody, everybody else must see you respectful, respecting him, submitted to authority and all of that.
But that man must know that you are a lion that is playing the game of a lamb. And the day you want to bite, you will bite. So make sure you're on top of your game. Know your onions. Prepare yourself for the future that you want. Don't allow anybody to have a reason. Don't play the girl card at work. It's nonsense. Do your work. Be good at your work. Gain the talents and the skills you need. Take challenges. Let other people be able to stand up and say, eh, no, if it's Funke, no, 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 no. I don't agree. This is who she is. She does this, she does that, and all of that. But when it comes to that one person, deal with it and stand. And sometimes, you need to move. And when you need to, start planning your career exit. And you make the next move. The environment must support you. If it no longer can support you, and you have no strategy to survive in that place well, find the next place that would help you. Job, there are no jobs. God will make a way. Thank you. God bless you.